So I'm very glad to be here. It's very exciting to meet you all and to be able to talk a bit about the thing that I spend most of my waking hours thinking about and working on, and that is uh, often Boston. So I'll show you a few, uh, a few uh, pictures just to tell you about who we are and who we are in the Norwegian market and what has happened in often Boston the last uh, 10 years. It's been uh, quite a journey. Let me see. So, uh, this is the Opera House in Oslo. I hope you will be able to visit Oslo and the Opera House in not too long and uh, get out of your home offices. But for now, you have to see it uh, this way. Uh, our vision, often Posten, strengthen democracy and freedom of speech through journalism you can trust. And I've underlined you can trust because that is, is a key issue here. And in our vision, that is really the reason why we exist, uh, why we uh, go to work every day. This is what we, we are trying to achieve. Uh, like every other newsroom, we, sometimes we succeed immensely and sometimes we don't succeed that well, but we have to have uh, some some holy grail to stretch uh, towards. Yeah, some often posted fa facts. Uh, Norway, it's a, it's a small, uh, it's a small country, five million people. It's a very strong media market. People really relate to Norwegian media. Uh, it's a society that is, uh, the, the, the trust is very high in Norway, which is important to us. The trust in the media is very high and even to the politicians. Uh, and there is a high propensity to pay for journalism. And this is uh, two sides of, of this story. Uh, people pay for journalism that they trust. Uh, often Boston is traditionally, and I would say also today, Norway's paper of record. Uh, an old evening uh, or morning paper, that is, owned by Shipstead Media Group, uh, which owns several, uh, several um, uh, newspapers. Uh, today we have uh, 257,000 subscribers, digital subscribers. We have 130 that are purely digital. Uh, readers, 50-50 men and women. Uh, earlier it was uh, more men than women, so we are very happy about this, uh, this fact. Uh, content behind paywall today, about 50%. We have about 180 people in the newsroom and the product team that is dedicated to often posting will be about 14 people now. Uh, and in Shipstead, we have about 240 and that is people working with uh, common tools and platforms and making and enabling, enabling all the journalists to have a good technology to work with. And the, the picture here is showing really subscribers um, how old are our subscribers? The blue line, that's the digital subscribers. How old are they? Uh, the red line, weekend subscribers, that is di digital during the week and paper during uh, um, weekends. And that is the complete uh, subscriber, I might say. They have both the paper issue and the digital uh, access. So you see that the digital subscribers are quite a lot younger, 20 years younger than uh, the paper readers. That are some facts and uh, we have all, I think the media houses in the world have uh, been going through a transformation that uh, is not too, too different from this. Uh, our revenues have really changed during the last uh, 10 years. Uh, you see that we have uh, had uh, really an advertising dominating revenue stream uh, 10 years ago and that has uh, shrinked uh, and we all know why. Uh, and uh, then the subscription revenues have increased uh, quite a lot in the same period, luckily. Just not that, that of course, doesn't, isn't explained by luck, but uh, we are very happy that we have succeeded in that. So the business model is actually turned upside down. In 2010, uh, the share of advertising revenues was about 60%. Now it's 20% and the user revenue share is 80%, meaning that the users are more important to us than ever. Uh, and we have to work with pleasing the users and challenging the users and making them happy with their subscription more than ever. This is, uh, you don't have to really look at all these uh, 
text uh, boxes here. There's just a story uh, until 2018, 2019, uh, when we made the decision in 2015 that now we have to go all in on uh, paid content. Uh, we had an identity crisis really uh, about six, seven years ago because we saw that often Boston didn't really, didn't really, we didn't feel at home in the uh, page view economy of uh, the digital uh, media. Our journalism isn't really a page view and uh, click uh, economy, and it doesn't really strengthen our journalists to chase uh, page views. So we tried uh, different models, and uh, during this period, we have learned more and more, and you see that our digital subscription has increased from about 20, 30,000 until today, where we have 130,000. And we are uh, running a, what we call a freemium with meter. That means that you can read, uh, I think it's eight articles now before you have to uh, start subscribing per week. Uh, or we have a content that everyone has to pay for no matter what, if they want to read it. And I'll get back to what content that is. Because content is king. Uh, and that means that the readers are stupid. They don't pay for content they can get anywhere. They pay for content that is uh, unique. Uh, and what we, when we did our analysis, we tried to find out what, what does the reader want to pay for? Uh, they want to pay for strong feature stories about humans, meeting meetings with humans who have an interesting story to tell. Uh, they want to pay for um, uh, very important journalism about uh, political and structural change in the world. And of course, in Norway, um, and they want to pay for journalism that can guide you in your life. Parenting, career, exercise. Uh, that's uh, categories of journalism where we can stand out. So we've been working a lot on that kind of content. So it's really unique journalism close to the view. So I don't expect that any of you understand what's on this uh, uh, picture to the right here because it's uh, part of our front page today. But this is our coronavirus um, uh, sort of the way you, you meet the coronavirus on our front page. And uh, what you see here, if you could read Norwegian, is that we are trying to do uh, very serious journalism on the coronavirus. Uh, yesterday or two days ago, we had a big uh, commission that have evaluated the work of the authorities. Uh, very harsh, harsh uh, evaluation. Uh, we've been working for weeks to get stories out in advance, to get into the numbers, to kind of challenge the authorities. And that we see that the users, they, uh, they thank us for that by paying for their subscription. So this is the digital subscription growth. Uh, we, uh, we just uh, crossed 130,000 uh, this last autumn. Uh, which was a very important goal for us. Uh, and we will try to reach 150,000 this year. But as you see, we had great growth uh, until 2018, 2019. Uh, we kind of got our natural share of digital uh, subscribers. Uh, but we are fighting more for every subscriber now. It's more difficult to, to get them in and to keep them. Uh, COVID, of course, gave us a boost. Uh, we increased the uh, subscriptions by um, over 10%. And all the media in Norway actually increased the uh, traffic and subscription. Actually, the trust in Norwegian media increased during the COVID year of 2020, which is uh, uh, very, very good news. Uh, but now we see that uh, we have to fight more for it. Uh, the old methods, the old ways of working, they could get us this far, but uh, couldn't get us any further. So we had to find out, get into the market and ask the readers, what do you expect from us? And in what form do you expect it? And then we got some interesting answers that uh, led us into the project that Kaloska will uh, go through with you uh, now. So, should I any from here? It's now. We can, we can take a pause. I see, see there's a few questions, so maybe we want to address those before we move on. Sure. Okay. So, should I answer the questions right away, Jackie? Corinne, do you want to ask those questions? Sure, no problem. Um, thanks, this is so interesting. Um, this, your graph had a really nice sharp rise um, 
with the 18 year olds upwards and that's not an easy group to get to engage with news let alone pay for it so I was curious how you did that um, and the other one was around do you break down uh, which forms of journalism and I know there would be disagreements about whether or not career and lifestyle is journalism but I think it is um, which one is the more profitable um, sources of journalism just out of curiosity thank you so thank you. Very good questions, both of them. And of course, the, the, uh, trying to reach the 18 or 20 years old, that, that I think we are fighting with that all over the world, really, that all the newsrooms are. Uh, and I think, I mean, of course, we reach them, but it, it's not as if it's, it's not a great, great success. Uh, we have to work uh, harder on it. But what we realized when we were working uh, now in the market and trying to find out what is our position in the market was that the young readers uh, that we can convinced to pay for journalism, they are really interested in core, often post journalism, foreign news and national news, but they have very high expectations in, in the way that we present it. But they don't want to read about, you know, just music or, or, or popular culture or uh, those issues. They are interested in that too, but that's not what they expect from us. So what we find, what kind of content are they interested in? Well, we have a natural, sort of ability to deliver something that's interesting to them and how in which form can we deliver it to make it interesting and, and we see actually that uh, we do have more and more paying uh, users in the in the well between 20 and 30 but uh, it's far far too too small the numbers uh, still so we have to work uh, more on that and what are the most profitable types of journalism that is really uh, uh, that is really an exciting question because you have some types of journalism that can bring the audience into our universe uh, and a very exciting news story uh, that is very unique and uh, you can bring uh, quite a lot of people into our newsroom. We just had a, a story about uh, suicide among young people, very big, uh, big story, uh, where I think we've just had uh, more than a thousand uh, sales on that story alone, which is a lot in our market. Uh, but of course, if many of those users come in and they are interested in that topic, but not other topics, then they get out again. Uh, and then it's not profitable. I don't think that's a good example for it, but we have to find out who are churning, who are leaving us and why are they leaving us and why aren't we able to keep them? And what we see is that really core journalism, that is profitable to be close to the news, uh, politics, analysis, commenting articles, uh, we have some indications that people stay longer when they arrive at, in our universe through those stories. Uh, Carl, do you, I don't think there's, there's any no, other questions here at the moment. Thought, they say no. Um, there was one hand um, raised here, I think, or at least a couple. Oh, sorry, two, yeah, two doubt. Go ahead. Yes, hi, I'm uh, from Amman. I run a, a community radio station and a news website and um, a big fan of Norwegian radio. Sorry about that because uh, they're always like number one in trust and I, you know, I'm trying to emulate that. But the question I have is about um, the decision you made like five years ago or whenever, because I'm always at that point that I'm trying to convince my financial team to go to put a paywall and they're all afraid because they're saying, you know, people will not pay and um, the uh, competition is all like, there's really no protection for uh, international intellectual property. Um, so my question is what, I mean, I, I want to know about that trigger, that one point where you agreed or you decided to go uh, to put the paywall. And also, if you can tell us a little bit about how much is your subscription and what do you do to get people to subscribe if you can. So uh, the, de the decision to, to sort of build the paywall uh, really came from, well, it came from need. But also, I think it's a, uh, it's 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 quite um well it's it's a bit of an ideology also i mean is our journalism worth paying for i i think it is we think it is i mean we spend a lot of resources on our journalism and when we see that the advertise the advertisers they have a lot more 
Um, the competition is very tough, of course, from Facebook and Google, and you all know those stories. Uh, but, and we also see that the income per page view or the price per page view is just falling and falling and falling. It will never, never rise. It will never, never rise. So our journalism in that market, either we had to change our journalism and see, OK, we have to hunt those page views. And that isn't really our place in the market. We have other media houses in Norway who do that a lot better than we do. Uh, and then we would just be one of many. So we had to see what, why, why were we uh, traditionally a very popular trusted media brand with that was because of the content. Then we have to bring that content into the digital world. And we have to say, as we've always said, when people were subscribing and getting the newspaper on their breakfast table, uh, this is worth paying for. Uh, and a good thing in Norway was that several Norwegian newspapers did this at the same time and were trying to test things and we were sharing experiences. And we also talked to the New York Times, of course, who have done a lot of experimenting and succeeding in, in this for many years. Uh, and we say, OK, we have to do this. This is our only way to success. We, we did, there's no alternative, really. Uh, so we tried quite uh, carefully to do it. And, and when we sort of found out that uh, if you have a good enough story, a unique enough journalism, then people actually want to pay. Then that was a boost in the newsroom. We started to, uh, to measure those numbers instead of page views and really motivating the organization to work with the journalism. And it's more demanding journalism than just the page view journalism. Uh, so we really had to change the culture, the way we were measuring things and the methods of journalism. Uh, and the presentation of journalism, which is uh, very important and which uh, Koloska will talk more about. Did that answer your question? Yes, and the price, how much you charge normally? What are the different rates? Yeah, we charge now, uh, that is, uh, would be 200, around 250 krona per month. That would be 25 euros per month, around that. Yeah. So it's in a Norwegian context, quite expensive uh, with the digital uh, subscription, but um, we think it, we think it's worth it. And uh, quite a few of the readers do, too. So we just have to fight for that. And one of the one of the guys leading that uh, fight is uh, Koloska. <laughs> Great. Uh, okay. I think we, we've tried that segue for a few times, so I think I'll jump into it and then we can do more questions as we go. Um, okay. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and then uh, talk you through one case study that I think exemplifies how we try to work with the digital news experience and how we kind of work across um, the different functions in our organizations to do that. So uh, this is kind of not necessarily a recipe for success, but it's at least here are some of the ingredients that we try to put into a front page project. So I trust you all see my screen now. So I'll just go uh, into it. So um, Trina mentioned that we, we did a positioning project and we tried to identify, well, where are we doing well and what, what are our weaknesses currently? And it was very clear that we needed to start looking at the, our digital product and the product experience there. And we scored quite low on a few of like, uh, and this, this, I took this personally as well as being responsible for product, seeing that all these things like appealing, user-friendly, giving an efficient overview and loading quickly were things that we scored almost lowest at out of all competitors, right? So why was that? It was clear that we had to do something, um, but it was also clear that we had some potential leading positions to take. So these are these are all kind of drivers of willingness to pay, and we mapped that out through more than a thousand interviews with with users. And what we found was that well, we might not be we might not be the best at these categories, but we are second best in a lot of them. So here's here's some potential. Here's a position that we can take. Um, and um, and we realized, well, what we need, first of all, for any project to succeed, if we want to work with digital product development, we need a unifying mission. And we had that in this, in this project, right? So we said, well, here's a clear problem to solve. Uh, and we have a clear mission where we um, want to explain the news better than anyone else. And that's kind of what we decided from this. We looked at our strengths and our weaknesses, and we said, well, if we take this position of like explaining the news, we're not going to try to be the fastest. We're not going to try to be necessarily the first to break 
um, to, to be sort of um, doing the, the breaking news game, but we will try to be the first with a good analysis. We'll try to be the first at sort of explaining in depth and taking the user through a story in a way that kind of respects their time. So, so that's kind of the position that we chose. And then we had a basis for, for building products that, that was not just about maximizing engagement or doing those types of things, but it was clear that we were trying to do something a little bit different that was set us apart. Um, and what was sort of baked into this position? Well, there were a few things that we, we looked into these drivers of willingness to pay and we translated them into some product principles. So we said, well, it's important and it's clear that we need to be better at giving users a quick and efficient overview and, uh, and helping users spend time on the stories that really matter. So as opposed to just giving them a constant stream of latest news, let's, let's guide the user to the stuff that really is important to, to focus on um, and respecting users' time in that respect. We want to also uh, find better ways of signaling the importance of each story. So in the digital world, everything can sort of end up looking the same versus on a, in a print world, you have all kinds of visual cues that will tell you how important the story is. So we said, let, let's try to bring that into the digital world. Um, and then we want to allow users, regardless of how much they already know, get context and get an understanding of, of a story that doesn't sort of assume that they have read uh, read the news for the past week, right? So how do we help users catch up and understand the context of stories? And then the last part is we want to be more than just a hard news type of destination. We want to enable users to get an engaging mix of content. We want them to get inspired. We want them to get curious and all those, all those things. So that's part of the package. So we don't believe that we should optimize only for what we call news value. Um, and the reason why we started by focusing on the front page itself was that, you know, this, if we're going to take a new position, this is kind of the first impression that users get, right? So it's the first thing you see, uh, it's across all devices, it's, it's on mobile, it's on our apps, it's on desktop, um, it's our main source of article views. So this is, this is the most efficient engine of, of getting users to that content and getting them to the quality of journalism that we serve. Um, and it's also a chance to stand out. So what we see is kind of a convergence in the way that that digital products are made, where it's everyone's kind of converging toward this news flow type of product, where basically it's the most important and most recent stuff on top. And as you scroll down, you get older content, less relevant content or less, less engaging content. So can we break with that news flow mindset? Um, the other kind of ingredient into the project, the front page project was we need to clearly define what success looks like. And there's something about having a subscription model that allows you to think a little bit differently about that. So um, we want our users to spend their time on our best journalism. So we're not, gonna, we're not gonna try to get users to stick with us for as long as possible or have autoplay videos or tease people into content that maybe they ideally wouldn't want to spend their time on. We want to guide them to the best journalism consistently. And it doesn't really matter if you engage with us 10 times a day or once a day. We, we just want that daily habit to, to stick. And um, that means that our success metrics also look different, right? We want to focus on things like active days and we want to look at long-term retention. We want to look at kind of the perceived quality of the whole product experience over time, as opposed to just optimizing for things like page views or session length or those types of things. Like a quality experience with us can be very short and it might be a good sign if you're spending a very brief period of time on our front page and getting the update that you needed. Uh, so that's, that's a kind of, and, and this is important, right? Because we had to establish that these were the success metrics at the very beginning because we were still kind of stuck in a mindset where we are optimizing a lot and we're measuring our success a lot in terms of uh, in terms of the page views and in terms of the traffic that we get on a daily basis. So we need to just set this clear from the beginning. The third thing um, that we focused on was we need to do this this thing that we in product and tech call discovery. So. How do we do discovery and delivery where we include all functions? So what we mean by that is 
we don't know what the right solution is at the beginning. We just know what the problem looks like. So we knew we wanted to address those drivers that we mentioned, but we didn't know exactly what types of changes we needed to make on the newsroom side and on kind of product and packaging and format side of things. So we need to have a process for discovering that. We need to involve all functions in that. And um, although we have this specialization across functions where we say, well, journalism is one thing, you produce and prioritize the content. Product and tech kind of works with a digital presentation and then the distribution of that content. Then consumer business, they, they figure out, well, how do we sell this and how do we package it and how do we take the user through the sort of the relationship of being a customer with us. We also need to talk about the thing that users see. So from a user perspective, this is the product, the sum of all those parts. So we need to have conversations about how we make that better. And that isn't solved in one, solved in one particular function. So we said, let's, let's talk about which users we should focus on. Let's talk about their needs and habits and let's do that together. Um, and let's look at how we together can build products and services that address those needs. So that means looking at the content just as much as looking at the, the formats and the digital storytelling tools that we have. And we want to have a mindset of experimentation and, 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 uh, and really focusing on, on, uh, on testing things early and testing risky assumptions. So we had, uh, you know, we looked at all the insights and I'll get a little more into that. Um, we got a share on, shared understanding of who are these users and what are their actual needs. And let's have that feed into all processes in this project. Um, let's do this type of product discovery and, and let's show it to everyone as we go. So let's have open demos where we say, well, these are some of our assumptions. We're, we worked with this hypothesis for the past week and this is what we found. Um, and we set this up in a way that allowed all teams in the organization to contribute to it. So we want a subscription and the subscription growth mission team to be involved in defining some of the, like the scope and which users we want to focus on. We want to explore what role personalization should, should play in our product. And we wanted to look at how we could rethink advertising. Um, and we, we ran these weekly demos to, to, to share and to, to get sort of an arena for talking about what we were learning. Um, and like I said, we're not really working with product unless we also talk about the content. So having the newsroom and product work together on this is important and, and figuring out, well, what are the principles for what we should show on the front page, on top of the front page? What, and, and how do we, and how do we really, uh, act on the insights that we see? Um, we also split into smaller experiment teams to work on specific hypotheses. So we said, well, how can we make the weekend better? Or how can we make the morning better? What are the types of things that users need at that point of the day? Um, how can we explain things in a smart but brief way right on the front page? So I'll show a couple of examples of that. But um, this is kind of like what the timeline looked like. I'm not gonna get into all the details here, but the key point here was that we need to we need to bring in the right team. So we need to talk, talk about, well, what does subscription growth look like? Who are the markets that, who are the users that we want to address that are likely to want to buy a subscription and what are they, their needs? Only when we have that, could we start looking at hypotheses for solving their problems. And then we, we started testing live on the front page. And the interesting thing here was that we started really asking the users, would you like to continue getting this feature and not being scared of showing to our users that we are experimenting with the product. So that was a key part of this was we, we actually started pushing solutions and exposing that to hundreds of thousands of users every day. And they were just experiments, right? And, and that kind of mindset was, was important to establish that we're willing to take those types of risks. And next week that feature might be gone, but we've learned something from it. And uh, this is my, I think almost my last point here, but this, this idea of working with an insights team to understand that our subscribers and our users are not one homogenous group. They're very, very different in how they behave. And they're also gonna respond very differently to the things that we experiment with. So we said, well, let's segment the users based on their behavior and based on their frequency. Let's assume that frequency is the best indicator of kind of your level of interest. So if you come often, you're more interested than if you come less often. 
And we see, of course, that this correlates with your likelihood of churning and your likelihood of staying subscribed. And what we found in itself, by just by doing the segmentation, is interesting, right? We see that the, the people that use our product very frequently, that we tend to assume are all subscribers, actually represent a quite a small group of users, right? So news lovers here is about 20% of the total user base. But what about all these other ones? Um, you see also that, well, it's the news lovers that account for most of the usage. But these are the ones that come in as new subscribers generally, right? So how do we build a better product for them? And how does this affect our algorithms and, uh, and uh, our tests when we have a very active group of, of, of uh, users that also have a low uh, likelihood of uh, churning? So we said, let's look at the majority of these people that are testing out the subscription. And let's look at their behavior. And we found that the majority of people that are trying a subscription, that are trial users, the majority of them visit less than once a day on average, right? So that means we have to think very differently about how to convince those users to stay. So we conclude if we want to grow, then we need to succeed with these types of users. And that's key to our success. And we saw that we constantly assume that people have visited us before, right? So this is the evening on a very <laughs> news heavy day. And we end up showing, you know, um, story recipes and other kind of interesting stories about people affected by, by Corona, but we're not covering the most important stuff. There's like big, big events that have happened worldwide, but we kind of assume that people have seen those things already, but we know that many people will have their first visits that evening. So the first visit has to show the best journalism and how do we, how do we make that happen? That was a key question for us to address. So this is kind of the, the process we went through, right? We understood what, how do people behave? Um, how do, what do we know about trial users? Then only then did we have a strong foundation for building a, a better front page. Uh, I'll show a couple of examples um, of that. Um, and these are things that you cannot build in product and tech alone. Uh, you cannot build them in the newsroom alone. You have to work together. Um, so we looked at this, this one driver that I mentioned earlier. How do we help users catch up on just the most important stuff? So if, if, if a user on average reads four articles a day, how do you help users read those four best articles? So here's one way that we explored where we said, okay, in the morning, can we just give you a, in addition to the general news flow, can we do a newsletter style introduction to the front page where we say, well, these are the things we're writing about today. This is kind of like our welcome to the site. Um, and showing that in the morning hours. And what was interesting was not only that we got the relatively high approval rating, but we saw that the casual users and daily briefers really liked it. So if we're trying to address those users specifically, this could be a good idea. Um, another thing we tested was this idea of giving users more context on the front page and reducing friction and helping users that might not have an hour, maybe they have five minutes to spend. How do we help them get an overview and understand context before they commit to spending five minutes reading an article? We said, we, we can make a front page that is a lot more snackable. We actually saw that half of our users, they came to the front page and they didn't click a single article. Like they didn't click a single teaser, did they? So they ended up just browsing the front page. So instead of trying to force more users to click on those articles, can we just make the front page itself a better product that actually gives you more context, that actually gives you more of what's sort of behind each article click? So we did that. We, we introduced a con concept called Briefly Explained, where we, we tell users more on the front page, and we want to reserve this for subscribers only. And we, um, yeah, and we saw again that this had a high approval rating among, among those, uh, those casual users. So um, this is kind of where we're at right now. We are trying to combine all these things together. And this is one of the, the most exciting parts is kind of, well, we've had all these learnings. How do we combine those? How do we combine new editorial principles that act on the insights that we've found how do we introduce the validated concepts that we have tested? Where do we place them? How frequently do we show them? 
what's the weekend experience versus the morning versus the afternoon weekday. Um, and uh, how do we use personalization that we also tested to tailor the experience to, to each individual user. So that's kind of where we're at right now. And I guess if we're gonna to try to sum up, I would say I've sort of mentioned all these ones already, but we think these are essential ingredients to succeeding with, uh, with collaborating and building product and building product in the true sense. So yeah, I think that sums up where we're at right now. And uh, it's still to be tested whether this front page builds loyalty and drives habits, but we are very excited to, to see. I see that there's been a hand here throughout the whole presentation, so yeah. <laughs> Can you, will you take the screen down, Carl? Can we I go will. back to? Sure. Yeah, sorry, okay. that was me. I had raised my hand before Carl Oscar's presentation, and it had been there all the time. Sorry if it was any distract, it, it caused any distraction. <laughs> and that's fine. So there, 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 um, Gulson, your question, and I know um, Esan had a question as well, which I think was back um, related to Trina's uh, presentation. So we'll take those because there's so much to unpack from what you just told us, Carl. But uh, Gulson? Thank you. you uh, I'm Gulsin Harman. I'm a journalist from Turkey and currently developing a podcast for a pod network of podcasts. Carlos Carr, thank you so much. It's, I can honestly say that it has been one of the most insightful presentations I ever seen about product management in a newsroom and the workflow, the breakdown of the workflow also, and was very stellar. So it will be great if we, you will agree to share the presentation with us in the future. And I have two questions, one for you and one for Trin, if I pronounce it right, about the culture. And Carlos, in your presentation, you ended your presentation with underlining the importance of the collaborative effort within a newsroom to achieve these goals. So how would you, what were the best practices that you can suggest to us who are working in this product immersion in, for small newsrooms? What are the best practices for communication across silos? Because in the past and from experience hearing from other colleagues, I know that the most tricky part is to bring people on board, uh, especially in the editorial team. And another challenge is to prevent, uh, to persuade the product people to think more, let's say it journalistic wise. So what were your biggest challenges and what are the advices that you can give to us? And for Terry, also many thanks for your presentation also. You had mentioned that we had to change the culture once we switched to Payball. And this is also a, quite a difficulty to achieve in a newsroom. So how did you manage to this shift to product thinking? And what are, again, the same question, what were the main challenges and what can be the advices? Thank you so much. Do you want to go first, Tatiana? Should I go? Uh, you can start, Carlos. Carl. Uh... Okay. So, um, what I, I would say there's there's a few things there, and and it's a really good question. So thank you for that. Um, it's it's easy to take for granted once you're there, right? So one, once you have an agreement about sort of direction and where you want to go, it's very easy to take that for granted. And I think we're very, <laughs> we're fortunate now to be a group of people that kind of have an agreement about where we're going. But I think that we're still on that journey of establishing that throughout the organization. But I would say a few things that, that are important. So one thing is, instead of presenting, so if I were to present some of these concepts, uh, and that was the first thing that I would do and say, well, here, here's, here are some ideas for what we should do, and or say, here's what I think we should change about how we edit the front page. That, that would probably fall flat on its face because it, there's no context building up to that. So I think we've been on the mission for quite a while to say, well, let's present some problems that we need to solve collectively. And let's talk about those problems to solve and the user needs that we see by looking into the data. And let's, let's be that be the starting point for a conversation as opposed to saying, well, I, from my function, I'm looking to optimize for these user needs. So, so I think we should do these things. So it's about kind of handing, not handing over finished solutions, but saying, these are some problems that we need to talk about. 
and let's find some forums for talking about those problems. So one one key thing that we started out with was was this assumption that people use us way more frequently than what they actually do. So so making that clear and letting that data speak and that kind of stands on its own, right? So if if you tell someone, well, I mean, the people who pay for this product, they visit us once, maybe twice a day. How do we respond to that? Like, what, what do you think their experience is like? And that that just provokes some some discussions, right? So, I think that was that was a, a starting point. And then, I think it's also about having people in the different functions who care deeply about journalism who are trying to to sort of understand that perspective and make an effort to to do that so that so that we don't come across as sort of aliens that speak a different language, right? So we need we need to start speaking the same language, but that goes both ways. So. So I see a lot of the, the evangelism that Dina does as well in, in the newsroom that is all about showing those insights and, and letting the newsroom sort of have a look at how we are analyzing the product and how it performs. So thank you for, for a great question. Um, uh, and, and I think that this is also a question where, where I, I wish I could say that we know all the answers, but we are working on it. It's work in progress. But I think uh, Koloska, he has some uh, key words here. I mean, data, I mean, use the data and really trying to convince people with what we know. Uh, because as we all know that uh, back in the old days when we were trying to decide what is a, what is a good front page, what is a good main story, uh, we used our gut feeling and our experience, and that is still important. Uh, but we saw that when we went into the digital world, uh, we need to have the gut feeling and experience, but we can't uh, base, uh, base our decisions only on that, because then there's so much we don't catch of information. So you have to combine experience and use of data, and then show people, okay, we thought this was going to work. It didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because the readers tell us that... Uh, one, we're not interested in the story, or they say, we are interested in the story, but we, uh, we read half of it. We don't finish it. Uh, in the middle of the, of the text, we, uh, we jump out of it and do something else. And then we have to ask ourselves, why does that happen? And uh, we are actually, we have data to show us, oh, there was an ad at the wrong place, or there was a, a title in the middle of the text that was uh, very distracting to readers. So we have to really get into the data. That's one thing. And the other thing is that I believe in painful openness. I mean, I, to talk about our challenges and really show everyone in the newsroom our numbers. This is working. This is not working. This is the trend. If we continue like this, I mean, we, when we did the big shift in um, 2012, 2015, uh, then we had to show people that, okay, our journalism doesn't really work in the page view economy. If we want to continue doing investigative journalism, if we want to continue uh, making uh, really great stories that we need to spend a week or two to research and write, we have to finance this journalism. And we can't do that if we are basing our, our, our economy on page views. And that's the language that journalists understand. They understand that we have to finance what we are doing. Uh, so we had to be painfully open about what we, what our challenges were. And I continue to be uh, open about that. And uh, of course, half the newsroom, perhaps they're not interested, but many enough are interested to actually uh, help me to strengthen and enforce the, the, the message. And then... Uh, of course, journalists, they are, they are interested in succeeding and uh, making, uh, <laughs> uh, contributing. And when they see that a story that they have spent weeks or months uh, to work on actually is a great success among the subscribers, and we see that half of our subscribers love the story, it makes them pay for their subscription the next month and the month after that, and we talk about that then that uh, pleases them and make them uh, eager to, to contribute. Uh, but of course, we are, on the culture part, the journalistic backbone reaction is, I want, to, I want to break news, I want everyone to read it, I want everyone to see it. I understand that uh, instinct, but we also have to finance it. Esa, you have a question about content, I think. You, you need to turn your mic on. 
and then MRA. Actually, my, my question is about, uh, uh, first, the congratulations on two really excellent presentations, Trini and Carl, and, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. And my question is about the very dynamic research process you have. Uh, uh, who does the research, internal or external consultants? Uh, how frequently is it done? And how do you communicate it, I presume, through the various teams? Thank you. Yeah, I can I can have a go at that that one. So we're fortunate to be part of uh, of Shipstead, which is sort of a, a, a collection, a conglomerate of different brands, right? So we have we have news brands in Norway and in Sweden, and we have shared teams that work with Data and Insight, and they sort of go in and they are embedded into the teams, uh, and they work with us for periods of time. So for the front page project, for example, there we said, well, we this is a this is a focus for us for this quarter or for this these next two quarters we're, we're going to need your contributions uh, as well um so we we definitely take advantage of the fact that we have a community of people that are constantly looking into these questions so they look into things like what are the things that that drive retention long term and um, what are the what type of content is it what type of um um, so what type of platforms and sort of user behavior helps drive loyalty over time? So are there specific product features that we do or formats that we do on the front page that typically causes people to come back more often? What role does it play if we get them to subscribe to a newsletter or if we get them to, to use the app more often? So those types of things we have sort of bigger analysis projects on. Um, and then we have also have local inside resources that do more of a day-to-day -day kind of operational analysis of how we perform. Um, but there's there's also in this particular project, we, we started looking into all kinds of questions that we hadn't really looked at before. So the data was there and the data was relatively available, right? So looking at the frequency of users that visit the front page, that it's it's all been there all along. But what we did was that we said, well, let's let's use that data and let's apply that as a layer in our analysis of different things. So let's so the segments that I showed you, let's let's use those segments and analyze the performance of a specific feature, or let's use that and analyze the way that users interact with certain types of content. And if you do that, then then your the the, the quality of your analysis suddenly jumps up a, a few levels because you're not just looking at, well, what does the majority and the really engaged users do? We shouldn't really be that concerned about those users because they already subscribe and pay the bills on a regular basis. We should be concerned with the users that are just about to be convinced that this is a great product, right? So I think that was key in this process was, was segmenting your analysis. And, and that, was, that was a collaborative effort. That was a lot of people being curious uh, and and I think, like Tina said, it is very much part of having a culture around it. I think many teams have inside resources, but it is about having people being really curious about those questions as well. But I have to say that we are fortunate in Shipstead to have made a significant investment in data as sort of a, an area that we want to, to focus on. I don't know if you want to add to that, uh, Tina. No, it's, it's just it's interesting because I think the data investments at the start was for uh, maximizing advertising uh, revenue. Uh, so we were trying to understand the users, but now we actually use those data to to maximize the subscription business, which is uh, which is interesting. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, here we go. Thanks, Everett, for that question. Who's joined us very early from the US? Uh, and welcome, Tony, who's joined us just now from Nigeria. And um, so, so S is on Ahmed Seha from Pakistan. Your question, and then Emre. My question is: Which type of content you are keeping for paywall? First question is this, and uh, second is: What is the ratio of the political stories on the front page? Thank you. Uh, good questions. Uh, we don't really have a ratio 
for political stories. The Norwegian readers are interested in politics uh, all year round, I would say, and uh, politics is uh, important to us. This year we have an election uh, and we have a big, um, uh, big uh, sort of uh, journalistic project covering all the party conferences and then the election in September. So we are, we are really building up to that election and are making uh, services that uh, people can subscribe to and typically are you a typical uh, typical uh, voter for this party or this party which is really popular uh, so politics is in is important um, and what type of content do we keep uh, behind the paywall well investigative journalism uh, where we spend uh, quite a lot of resources uh, we keep that behind the paywall but as any news organization we can't have 150 people working with investigative journalism, then we wouldn't have enough stories to to publish around uh, around the the week uh, or through the week or through the year. So uh, we have to have those big projects uh, and launch quite a few of those uh, during the year. But we also have to say that okay, do we trust us in okay the COVID COVID stories, uh, which is really a big story that uh, everyone is following. Are we able to deliver unique journalism about COVID? Are we able to do something uh, close to the, to the news every day or at least two or three times a week? And we, and we think we are because we say that, okay, this team will now work on that story for, for five days and see what they can, uh, uh, can make of it. And they make stories every week. Uh, close to news that uh, subscribers enjoy reading and that we say uh, and that they come into often post universe paid universe to read uh, so and also I think part of when we say that 50% of our content is now behind pay paywall one of the reasons is of course that we want people to uh, come in behind paywall but the other reason is to show the people that are already there the value of the subscription mm -hmm. It's not interesting to subscribe if you see that most of the stories are given away for free. Uh, then you would say, then why, why should I pay? So we have to show them the value of the subscription and that will be increasingly important. Emery. Thank you. Uh, my question for uh, Trine, I think uh, if I didn't see wrong uh, in one of the slides, uh, the other revenue category, which is the ones except subscription and advertising, is somehow same or even lower than a decade ago. It's unusual uh, compared to some other media outlets that I, I've uh, studied because most of them other revenues are rising. So event organization and other stuff, for instance, or merchandising and such stuff. Uh, what's your other revenue strategy? Uh, our other revenues, we have a, a kind uh, or a small uh, publishing unit uh, that uh, publishes monthly magazines. And we have a wine club and we have uh, uh, this uh, card for subscribers. but. Uh, events, we have tried to, to make money on events, but that has been very, very hard. So we have actually changed that strategy and just said that, yeah, we will do events, but that will be very close to the core. Uh, that is the journalism uh, and use it more as in strengthening the loyalty to the subscribers and uh, getting subscribers in than just have it as a, a revenue stream. Uh, so other other incomes aren't that big and it's uh, we are discussing actually right now what is our strategy on this area how many different income and revenue streams will we have uh, and how well how different should they be from what our core core business is uh, but uh, it's, it's a good observation when that you see that uh, that that share of the revenues hasn't increased Thank you. Uh, Javier? Hi, Hale. Uh, uh, congratulations for the presentations. Uh, so my, my questions are basically both and a little bit more uh, granular. Uh, 
with regard to first it's the format of the content which one uh, do you think that uh, has proven to be more useful in terms of uh, bringing in more subscribers and i'm mentioning that because um, it's been said that podcasts for example tend to bring more um, young users etc so i want to know more a little bit uh, about the about the format, I know that really depends on the content, but it would be interesting to know your experience. And the second one, <coughs> sorry, that has to do also with the, um, yeah, how you interact with the users and whether that interaction with the users create this sort of community feeling uh, that would potentially increase the uh, subscription base as well. Just just the questions to guide us a little bit. Hmm. So I think uh, Koloska, he can uh, contribute in answering this question, I think. But uh, if you look at, uh, well, the format or the platform, that podcast is actually, it, it's quite important to us, especially uh, regarding communication with uh, a younger audience, uh, because they are, of course, eager podcast listeners. And, and we started quite early with podcasts and uh, also have a few nice successes. Our podcasts now are not for subscribers or, or they are not uh, exclusively for subscribers. So that has been a way to kind of invite people into our universe and getting to know us and some of our journalistic profiles and um, uh, creating some interest in uh, the content that we make and that you have to be a subscriber to read about. Uh, and and we try to sort of do some surveys to see if, if this strategy is working. And we see quite a few indications that it does and that the trust in often post uh, brand is increasing through the podcasts uh, where we sit and talk about uh, journalism and uh, present journalism in another way. So that is quite important for us in the future. And we will launch together with the Shipstead Group uh, subscription product for podcasts and really put podcasts behind the paywall as a main strategy this autumn, uh, which is uh, quite a big bet for us. And we are trying to really compete with uh, the big players in podcasts in the world. But, but uh, we, we are optimistic. Uh, and uh, about user engagement, I think that very few, very few media houses do do that well enough. And neither do we. Uh, so I think that all the, the service or, or the data collection that uh, Kaloskar and uh, the team has done uh, when they were working with this front page project, or they are still working on it, uh, where they are really putting things out to the user and say, do you like this? Would you like to use this? Then we are really close to, the, to their habits and their needs. I think that is a, it's a bit of a revolution, really, uh, the way of working so intensely with communicating with users uh, that they do. And I, I think we, one of our ambitions this year is really to work that way a lot more often. And uh, one of our goals will probably be that every uh, journalist should uh, participate in one of those projects at least once a year to, to try to work with users and listening to users. Uh, both the, uh, working with data and also with focus groups. And I can just I can just add to that that there's there's um, a few ways of looking at um, looking at kind of the subscription model that we might want to challenge as well as as this market matures and as also kind of the market is saturated with more and more content that you can access at any time also for free, right? So. When we talk about conversions, one thing to note is first of all that the, the things that cause people to convert, that the content is slightly different from the, the stuff that keeps people loyal. So if you look at that, look at the correlation between the types of content that are read by people that stay subscribed, that's that's quite different from the stuff that causes people to convert. So one thing we do just technically is that we have two different algorithms. We have one algorithm that ranks content for uh, optimized for conversions. And we have another one that is ranked more for loyalty and that that one is optimized for for the subscribers and there's there's i could go into lots of details about that model but but there's uh it's there's a very strong sort of editorial hand over that algorithm so it's optimized not for maximum engagement but it's optimized for loyalty and ensuring that users over time feel like they become more informed citizens by having a subscription. So that's sort of one part of tackling conversions and looking into what, uh, how do we ensure that we keep conversions going while we are also 
also um, uh, keeping people loyal and serving them the type of content that they appreciate as, as a subscriber. But it is also about changing the mindset of what we are selling. Like, what really is a subscription? Well, it's not purely access to content, right? Access to content is the smallest problem for people today. Like, you have all kinds of content coming at you all the time. So our sort of the thing that we sell is really uh, the knowing that you are reading the right content and knowing that you are um, you are spending your time on stuff that really matters. And, and that's a shift that we're seeing. And also with the stuff that we mentioned on the front page, if we can help curate the news in a way that makes sense, that's probably a lot more valuable than us producing 100 articles a day. So, so that, that's also a shift in terms of, well, what are we selling and, and what type of format and content are we trying to get to users? It's, it's a lot more about, well, here are the things that you should read and, and you're paying for that menu and for someone giving you that menu of content on a daily basis. And um, we're, we are talking about products in the sense that does not just focus on, well, which articles can you access, but what types of product features can you access? So things like getting a brief summary of a story on the front page or getting a, a morning summary or, uh, or things that are um, more in sort of the podcast and audio domain. We want to reserve those features for subscribers as well. So you're getting a product that is not just about accessing X number of articles a day, but you're getting a product that holistically just serves you better, right? In all kinds of ways in, and not just content access. So that's a dimension that we're exploring a little bit uh, and, and are still exploring right now. And then could I just, uh, Jackie, could I just uh, add that um, uh, communication with users is also, is also about how do they perceive us? Uh, how do they perceive us? Do they perceive us as impossible to get in contact with? Do they perceive us as arrogant? Uh, do they perceive us as unwilling to correct errors? Uh, and if that's the perception, uh, then we have a problem because that is about uh, trust. It's a story about trust. And trust is, I can't even begin to explain how important trust is to us. And we are measuring, of course, the trust that uh, the, the, the audience uh, have. And uh, we have to work all the time to increase and strengthen and keep that trust. And that means we have to correct mistakes when we make mistakes. We have to, we have to be honest about the way we work. We have to be transparent about our methods. We have to explain editorial decisions uh, and be really more and more open about the way we work so that people can look at us and we invite them in and say, if there's something you do, you you wonder about or that you don't trust or you think that we made a mistake, contact us. We will go into that dialogue and if we haven't made a mistake, we will as quickly as possible correct that mistake because I think that has been uh, media houses or newsrooms that don't understand that, uh, that how important that trust is. Uh, they don't really have a future in this uh, subscription economy. You don't subscribe to a product you don't trust. And how, how important is having things like comments on your site, do you think, in terms of like building that, that trust and that open relationship? And are there any other, um, you know, that, are there any other sort of things that you do specifically to, to build trust? Well, you mean comments from readers or from... Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like having just that conversation, because I know a lot of people are moving away from it. Yeah. And I wonder sometimes how wise that is. Yeah, so we have we have discussed we have also discussed should we should we move away from it because we see that some of the people who engage in in those on those platforms or those arenas they are they aren't really that constructive and uh, they kind of scare away other more or should I say more sensible users because they think that I don't want to get into this debate universe it's just too harsh and it's just too rough and and we actually edit uh, the comments on our sites but uh, I see just personally when I've written stuff if I go in there and I answer and I just answer questions and I and I show them that I read what they are writing then that works a disciplinary disciplinary way because then people oh there's a person there perhaps I should do something about my language and the way I the way I discuss this so that always helps uh, but it, it's not the discussion on our site is not very very important but of course on Facebook we have some discussions that we have to moderate and uh, and really moderate quite 
harshly sometimes because uh, you, we all know the social media debate culture. It's not really uh, always very uh, constructive. Uh, but we have to have a tone of voice. We have to be polite. We have to be uh, humble. And we have to be honest and open. Uh, and we have to agree that uh, that's the way we present ourselves uh, on those uh, arenas. Tim, you have a follow up. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. And thanks for really a very in interesting presentation. It's so encouraging. I wanted to pick up on, on this word of trust, which seems to have resonated throughout the whole, um, the whole morning. How do you measure the trust apart from subscriptions you know that kind of thing how about how do you go about actually showing that people do trust you what does mm -hmm. that mean and a second question if i may uh which goes back to your your strategy for kind of building a a value proposition based around your mission which is perhaps to go from being a paper of record to being a paper of insight you know you mentioned offering more context offering cl clear explanations signaling what's important and i remember you used the phrase uh insight and inspiration and i just wondered what you mean by inspiration what does what what does that word mean for you as a newsroom what are you trying yeah. to inspire how does that engage your readers yes thank you thank you that's a good question i can start with the with the last part of your question i mean inspiration i think in our world is inspiring people to engage themselves in uh, in uh, in debate in uh, in the society in the community and really uh, inspiring them to see this is important to me uh, i have to know more about this i have to read more about this so so it's not i think it's not inspirational in the sense that uh, why don't you cook more with chicken it's not that kind of inspiration that's uh, primarily the goal but uh, more, more engagement I, I would say uh, and uh, about measuring uh, trust uh, we, we, we have quite a few um, uh, ways uh, I mean in the Norwegian media market we, we talk about this a lot so the media organizations they measure trust every year uh, two or three of them measure it in different ways and they just compare the different brands and does it go up, does it go down? Uh, and we also have our own uh, brand tracker where we measure every month uh, because across brands in ships that because trust is, uh, is a key, uh, key value for us. So if we see that suddenly uh, trust is falling or we have some big changes in the numbers, then we really have to get into why that is. Uh, it has happened that trust has fallen, but then, we, we have, then there has been some scandal connected to one of the brands um, where some bad journalistic uh, methodology has been exposed. And the learning is really that sometimes that can happen, then we have to be really open, go out there, uh, excuse ourselves to the readers and just say, we are so sorry for the mistake. And then you can rebuild trust, but you must never, never just uh, ignore those uh, changes. Corinne, you had a, another question about... Uh... Go, go ahead, about user testing, I think. It w yes, it was about user testing. Um, I had a chance earlier this year and late last year to work on a project that was informed by human-centered design, which is the first time I've ever worked on something in that way. And I don't have that expertise, but I was able to partner up with someone and it changed my life. So I'm really interested in, um, you know, how you, you mentioned, um, Carl Oscar, that you know, there were some things that you were assuming about people or that, you know, you thought they would behave in a certain way, etc. So what I'm really interested in is what your techniques and if you're happy to share also the, the platforms or technologies that you're using, perhaps including actually talking to people, focus grouping, etc. to really get to know your users um, so that you understand their personas and, you know, just a little bit more about that. Yeah, for sure. And, um, and I think this is partially what, what product and technology teams bring to the table is that methodology. You know, it is kind of design thinking methods and it is the idea that, that you should actually expose stuff that you believe in to users before you implement that as something permanent. It is about being critical of kind of, well, what are the alternatives uh, here? Uh, is this the best way of solving this problem for the user? 
or is this just an idea that we had that we thought was great and, and we implemented it and we kept it there? Uh, so it's also about being critical of own processes. And that's why I think it's it can be painful and it can be a tough transition to make. And that's why we sort I'm of just, start I'm just with... laughing because I, I don't think I ever heard someone ask me, but why so many yeah. times? But why are you doing it that way? Yeah. Exactly. And I, and I think that's uh, that's at the core of it is about being curious and it's about kind of trying to understand uh, trying to understand users as sort of individuals and uh, and having methods for going out there and speaking with them. So there, there's a whole playbook for how to do that. And and um, and, you know, sometimes it can get a little out of hand as well, where you know, you can have an external design firm that will tell you you need to spend half a year doing like diary studies of your users, right? And sitting with them with them in in their uh, in their living rooms and and studying. So so the, it's also about finding a balance there. But there's one thing about newsrooms that's interesting and about and about media houses is that we constantly interact with users and we constantly have an opportunity to to speak to users and to understand their needs and their frustrations and. Uh, and we, we we try now to tap into that as well and to have everyone, including people in a newsroom, be curious about how users act. And I think that that is more of a culture than a set of methods. Um, and uh, and there's there's all kinds of methods you can use, but we do on a regular basis do. So we, we combine quantitative and qualitative data when we do things like we know that people say that they do things that in reality they don't do. So that some people will say, well, I, I, you know, I always read the politics section and, and culture, and then they end up reading a, a lot of other things that maybe are, aren't as a sort of fit to their, their ideal profile. And, um, and uh, we tried to go beyond that with some interesting techniques. So one thing we did was that we, we, we set up interviews where we actually did a targeted ads for people that we knew had specific reading behavior. And then we set up qualitative interviews to talk to them about that. So we already knew ahead of time what type of behavior, what type of segment does this reader belong to? So there's there's six techniques that we can use there. But I think at the end of the day, it is it is about making sure that you don't think you know before you've tested, and uh, and having smart ways of testing. Like I said, we, we when we launch something, that's that's never the final product, and it's also it's always the starting point. Uh, and uh, and we get users to respond to new features that we launch. Is this useful to you? We look at well, to what extent do people start coming back more frequently after being exposed to this? So there's a whole range of of methods, but at the end of the day, it is about kind of not assuming that we already know what the answer is. Um, so that that's kind of the the starting point for a lot of these uh, projects. Okay, so so we're getting to. Um getting to the end of our, our time. I just wanted to do, does anyone have any reflections, final you know, thoughts or reflections before we close up? Go, Tony. Well, um, I'm sorry I got in late and, um, and I wondered whether uh, there will be a copy of this to watch the presentation. Um, I mean, in Nigeria and and, and mostly Africa, uh, the newsroom hasn't really figured out what to do, how to create that news product, um, because funding of media is fundamentally it's a big challenge. Um, in, in so many respects. And um, uh, you haven't got big corporates that have interest in media, funding media. Uh, funding media is around individuals and the newsroom is left in, in the balance more or less and the temperament of those who pay for those companies. So, um, the African continent is really, really, really struggling. It's, it's a big problem. I mean, where I think a lot of successes have been seen is in parts of Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, but around West Africa and, and perhaps Northern Africa, uh, the, the newsroom is in their straits of what kind of model should it be? 
because on one hand, you have someone who is funding the media company, who has a lot of money and baggage, and his actions or inactions affect the society that are newsworthy. And as a result of that, you know, you have a mismatch of what does a newsroom do? What does newsroom report? What is the interactivity of um, the audience and the content itself and, and so on? So um, uh, I'll really be interested to see, you know, what you have done and, uh, and how we can learn from that. Okay. I could just jump Anyone in. Some, no, yeah. No. Hi, Jackie. I just want to say thank you guys for, for, for your honesty, for sharing. Um, really, really uh, impressed with um, the presentations. And um, yeah, um, you've given us, you're know, certainly me, you've given me some homework to, to think about. Um, you can tell there's like a, a top team of uh carl um what you guys do in the product stuff um yeah you know the rest of i'm sorry i'm from zimbabwe so i understand what tony's saying um yeah we would we, we know it's it's you know obviously we're starting from a from a different place but um yeah really impressed with what you had to see what, what you had to share um yeah keep pushing keep keep uh, moving forward Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Trina, Carloska. Anything? No, I, just to, I just so, want so to say quickly, thank you. Uh, all quickly, the, uh, quickly the, the question, sorry, question. Quickly the question is Are we going to get a, a copy of the presentation? Yes. I, I didn't have the opportunity of seeing it. Yes, okay. yes, we'll, we'll get a copy, we'll share a copy, and we'll also ask uh, Trina and Carloska for their slides to share. Okay, thank you. Sure, no problem. And again, thank you for all the all the interesting questions. I, I learned from every question, and uh, uh, I just want to be uh, honest about the fact that we we are this is work in progress. Uh, we are improving all the time, hopefully, and uh, hopefully we'll have more to share in a year or two or three or four. So just uh, keep asking questions, and if you want to reach out, then of course you can do that. Uh, and I also um, want to just. Um, uh, say very clearly that I understand that we are in quite a different market than many of you, a uh, different kind of society and different kind of interest, I might say, from the political authorities uh, regarding the value of uh, journalism and uh, high quality journalism and critical and investigative journalism. But uh, I just uh, keep up the good work. You're, you're doing an important job out there. And I think just to add to that, I think we'd love to hear um, you guys challenge some of the assumptions that we're making as well. I think it would be interesting to hear if you guys have found things to be different from what we have. And are we, you know, are we making assumptions here that we shouldn't be making? I think that's something we're always curious to, to hear more about from, uh, from other media houses as well. So feel free to reach out and thank you all for, uh, for uh, having us. Okay, well, thank you so much to Afton Paulson and Trina and Carl Oscar. It's, I think you can see from the comments and the questions you've had, it's been such an interesting presentation. And I mean, it's just such an interesting journey that you guys are on. And um, we, what, what we'd like to do from this is we'll share the video and we'll share the slides. And if everybody's happy, we'll connect you all. If you're, Melissa will be in touch about that. But if you, um, you know, just, just by email, so for follow-up questions. Also, we, we would love to get feedback from any of you, any thoughts that you had or, or you know, thoughts for other newsrooms um, you'd like to visit. I mean, we, we know, you know, that the IPI Global Network, you know, it's, it, there's so much wealth in it. It's, um, it's such a resource and we're very happy that we've found a way to surface that and to share it. And uh, so, you know, we'll be moving forward with more